Okay, all right. We're going to go get started. I uh, want to welcome everyone to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. My name is uh, Jerry Shockey. I oversee all the youth and educational programs here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And we're extremely excited that, uh, especially those on the east uh, here, that, uh, that we're able to tune in, that you beat the weather and the cold, and, and we're able to make it to class. Uh, so we're excited to bring to you this Heart of the Hall of Famer series featuring Pro Football Hall of Famer, Mr. James Lofton. Uh, Mr. Lofton's a veteran of this program. He's done uh, done this two or three times now from a, a variety of locations for us. So, uh, Mr. Lofton, we appreciate you being here today. But uh, uh, I know young blood; those students in there are probably new to this, as well as the students at Baldmolis University and those that are tuning in via our webinar. Uh, the real idea and premise behind this series is to convey what it takes to get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame beyond just the athletic ability. We know our Hall of Famers, like Mr. Lofton, are, are awesome examples of athleticism and skill and talent. Uh, but it, it, it took a lot more than that to get in trying to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, I, and I've got a little secret for you guys, and I don't think it's much of a secret, but these character qualities aren't just character qualities being great football players, but these are character qualities to be in Hall of Famers in everyday life. Uh, so whether it's the six pillars that, uh, you know, especially the young people out there are probably studying, the trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship, or, you know, a variety of other character qualities it takes to get enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So we're excited to give you the opportunity to uh, interact with Mr. Lofton here today so he can share his life experiences and maybe help you along in, in your life experience as well. So um, with that being said, I would like to uh, thank a, a handful of people that helped make this broadcast possible. Uh, first and foremost, our, our friends at Extreme Networks. I know our, our friend Linda out there is uh, helping facilitate the sites for us out in California. Thank you, Linda, for your help there. We also have to thank our friends at San Diego Community College District, uh, Caesar and, and uh, Matthew uh, making the arrangements. They've posted about six or seven of our guys now, and including Mr. Lofton a couple times now. Uh, thank you for opening your doors and, and connecting Mr. Lofton back to us so we can do this program. Uh, I would thank the teachers, the students, and everyone who's tuning in. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is, is recognize those two schools uh, that we have connecting in. And, and if anyone wants to give a shout out via our hashtag, uh, that's tuning in over the webinar at uh, hashtag Heart of a Hall of Famer. Feel free to do so, and I'll I'll mention you on camera here as well. But uh, the two schools that are tuned in, uh, I'll give you a second to, to give a little shout out if you want to. I know we've only got a few students in Baltimore, so it's not going to be overwhelmingly loud there. Oh. On so, uh, Baltimore, you want to give a little oh. little A or something like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bowen Wallace. And then uh, we're going to shoot across to uh -huh. Houston, Texas, to our friends at Young Blood Intermediate. If you want to mute and say hello. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So what we're going to get to is the introduction of our featured speaker, and that's Pro Football Hall of Famer, uh, Mr. James Lofton. And first of all, he was uh, uh, he played for the Packers. Uh, the Raiders, the Bills, the Rams, and the Eagles throughout his career. He was selected by Green Bay, uh, first round, sixth player overall in the 1978 NFL Draft. He was a deep threat receiver. He possessed both speed and great hands. You'll hear about that speed a little bit more when we talk about his college endeavors and things like that. He recorded more than 50 receptions in a season nine times. He was the first NFL player to score a touchdown in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. In his 16 seasons, he got 764 passes for 14,004 yards. So at that time that he retired, 14,004 yards was the all-time NFL record. So you're talking about the career receiving yardage leader that you're talking here today at that time. So he was named All-Pro four times, All-NFC three times. He was selected to play in eight Pro Bowls, and he was born in Fort Ord, California. Uh, so that's a little bit about his on the field. Let's look at uh, his off the field, because I think what you'll find about our our, our guys that uh, as remarkable as their on the field career has been, um, their off the field career is, is as remarkable, if not more remarkable. Uh, first, he graduated from Stanford University, so obviously someone who uh, valued education with a degree in industrial engineering, so, so uh, a, a smart athlete, obviously. Uh, he, his athletic achievements, he was All-American in track and field uh, and football at Stanford. He actually competed in the Olympic trials in 1976. Um, he's other athletic honors in Stanford Hall of Fame, Miller Man of the Year finalist, as well as the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. His coaching experience includes stints with the uh, San Diego Chargers, as well as the Oakland Raiders. 
Uh, he's been involved in broadcasting, which he still is, currently is, where he's been he's at the James Lofton television show that was in Green Bay for five years and Buffalo for three, uh, the Pac-10 uh, preview show, CNN NFL preview show, NBC NFL analyst, the Fox Sports Net analyst, and uh, as what he is currently is a league game analyst for Sunday Night Football for Westwood One, where he's actually worked for, I think, five or six now straight Super Bowls for Westwood One. Um, uh, one thing that you'll find with our enshrinees is that, uh, uh, is that not only are our gold jackets that are not only that they're uh, heavily involved on the field and, and with their works, and you see the, I see Mr. Lofton showing the jacket there, um, is that uh, you'll find that the, when you talk about those pillars and you talk about uh, um, citizenship and caring, and I think that's really where a lot of our guys shine because of uh, they've been able to use that that uh, uh, that uh, gold jacket and that, and that Hall of Fame status to 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 further other endeavors in their life and things that they're very passionate about. Whether it's uh, um, you know Mike Haynes who does a lot of stuff with uh, can you know, cancer, prostate cancer and whatnot, to to other guys like um, uh, James Lofton. But he's a March of Dime spokesman in Wisconsin. He's a Milwaukee Ballet board member. Uh, fundraiser for Golden House. Uh, it's the Green Bay's first domestic violence shelter. The United Way spokesman for the Packers, as well as been involved with the Wisconsin Special Olympics volunteer. Uh, he's participated with fundraisers for Green Hill School of Dallas. His wife chaired the gala and served on the board. So uh, just a number of things that he's been involved with as well. Uh, personally, he's married to his wife, Beverly, who is just an awesome, awesome lady um, uh, for 30 years, and that's an accomplishment with itself for somebody that's coming up on his 10 year anniversary or, or almost 40 years. No, uh, 34. 34. Okay. 34 years. So I need to update my bio, James, I think <laughs> a little bit. So, uh, he's got three children, David, Daniel, and Rachel, and he's a member of the rock church in, in, in San Diego. So if you guys will just give me a second here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to queue up for you it is a quick highlight film of Mr. Lofton just so you can see a little bit about his on the field. The great hands and even greater speed of wide receiver James Lofton made him one of the premier deep threat receivers of his era. Lofton played for five teams in his NFL career. He joined the Buffalo Bills in 1989, and in 1991, he became the oldest player in the history of the NFL to have over a thousand yards receiving in a season. When his career ended, James Lofton had scored 75 touchdowns, caught 764 passes, and owned one of the most prestigious records in the NFL. He retired with the most yards receiving in the history of the league, 14,004. So if uh, you all would un unmute your microphones and join me and give a warm round of applause to Pro Football Hall of Famer, Mr. James Lofton. Thank you. I see all the students at Youngblood already have their notes ready and all that. Well, I will just give you a little bit more information about myself, and I'm also going to talk about the uh, six pillars. And one of the things that about the six pillars that that, that I like, and and kind of a, a picture that I like to to draw from, is that a couple of years ago, my wife and I were actually celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. Jerry mentioned that we've been married for 34 years, and we took a trip to uh, Italy, and we went to Rome. And if you've ever seen pictures of the Parthenon and some of these old buildings, they all have these massive columns. And these massive columns are what holds up the roof and, and, and the foundation for the structure of the buildings. And so these, these pillars that we talk about uh, in the Hall of Fame are pillars that you kind of want to build your foundation on, kind of that you want to be important to you in your life. And... Some may come into play a little more than others, but they're all important to be able to give you a great foundation, to give you a roof over your head, because there is always going to be times in your life that are a little bit up, a little bit down. But if, you, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your foundation is strong and if your pillars are strong, uh, you're, you're going to be able to endure a lot. You're going to be able to accomplish a lot. And you're going to be able to do a lot over the course of your lives. Um, it's interesting that the first one, and I'm going to mention all six of them. Trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, 
caring, and citizenship. The first one, trustworthiness, always think about, um, you know, either, either you're an, an older brother or a younger brother, or you might be the only child, but you, you have some cousins or somebody who are younger, older than you. And if you're, if you're trustworthy, at some point your mom says, I want you to watch your little brother or your little sister, or you want you to do this. And so you have to gain that, that trustworthiness by what you're able to do when someone asks you. I was on a conference call. I mean, I was on the. That's very important. I had to log into the. Uh, Linda, uh, Linda, Linda you're, you're unmuted. You're unmuted, Linda. Linda. And I, it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> now Linda's muted. There, I got it. <laughs> the second one, you know, is respect. Um, there was a football player who played for the San Francisco 49ers, and he was, you know, one of the great players that they had. And in the locker room one day, he asked the guys around the locker room why they played football. And they were kind of, everybody's just kind of hanging out. A couple of guys said, oh, I, I played because, you know, I always wanted to be famous when I was a kid. A couple other guys said, I play because I want to make a lot of money, which is not a, not a bad reason. And a couple of guys said, you know, I play because I want to win games. And I want to be on a championship team. And this one player said, the only thing that you're able to walk off the field with after a game is respect. And you've played against somebody for 60 minutes on the clock, been out there for over three hours in real time. And when you walk off the field, you kind of walk, you know, cross paths with the guy that you were just battling against. You shake his hand and you've earned his respect. And respect is something that you don't give away, but you really do have to earn. And I always thought that that was pretty important. Now, responsibility, uh, one of the other pillars, is something that you have to show. It's, it's, an, it's an action. Um, and, and, you know, you, you all know when you're, you're being responsible, when you've kind of done the right thing, when people can look at you and say, from a distance and say, I, I like what that young person is doing. I like what that adult is doing. That's when you show great responsibility. Uh, the next one is fairness. And it's interesting. I think in, in our society today, uh, when you look at things that are going on in your city, in your state, around the country, we, we, we start to view things and we say, is this fair for both parties involved? Um, and I think that that is a really critical uh, issue in today's society because there's a lot of acceptance of a lot of people from uh, a lot of different places who have different lifestyles. And we have to look at them and say, okay, what's going to be fair for everybody involved? And those are really, really critical issues and that you guys are going to have to be uh, responsible for. And, and kind of that goes along with this, another pillar that kind of goes right behind that fairness is caring. How you treat other people. This is so important. If, if my wife has a little thing on, on the refrigerator and it says, do something nice for somebody else today. And that just shows that you care about people. You know, little things uh, go a long way because you don't know when you've treated somebody nice, how they go about the rest of their day, how they feel about themselves. And then they may feel so good about themselves that they do something nice for somebody else. And this kind of leads us into the last pillar. You know, we've talked about trustworthiness, about respect, about responsibility, about fairness, about caring, and about citizenship. Because as you're sitting in, in your classroom, you're, you're the member of a larger body. At home, it's, it's your family. Then you go to your neighborhood. Then you go to your, your local community. You go to your state. You're also a representative of this country. You may not believe it or not, but when, when people are coming from out of, out of the country and they meet you, they're meeting an American citizen. They go, oh, well, that's how I was treated by that citizen. And then you're part of the, the global community, everybody in the world. Um, we all talk about uh, how small the world has become. Uh, there was a, a book and then a movie years ago called Six Degrees of Separation. And in that movie and in that book, the premise was that you and I and everybody around the world are only separated by six people. And you go, oh, well, how, how could that be? How could, how could that actually be? Well, now, you guys have kind of met me today. Okay, so that's, that, that's one person. Um, my wife grew up in Arkansas. So now, now we're the three people. 
she interviewed President Bill Clinton when he was the governor of Arkansas. So now we're at four people. Now think about how many people Bill Clinton knows. He obviously knows President Barack Obama. Barack Obama knows President Vladimir Putin of Russia and all the other global leaders. So just within five people, we connected to everybody around the world. And so it really is a small world when you, when you break it down like that. And you guys through your lives will find that, that you're a citizen, not only of your family, of your neighborhood, in your community, of your state, of this country, but you're a citizen of the world and how quickly all those other pillars that you're asked to build your life around, the trustworthiness, the respect, the responsibility, the fairness, the caring, all those are gonna come into play really in your everyday life. And people are gonna view you and, and, and judge you on how you demonstrate those characteristics. Jerry? All right, thank you, Mr. Lofton. I appreciate your opening remarks, and I do know a couple of our uh, uh, folks uh, tuning in the webinar have submitted questions as well, and we'll get to those here in just a minute. But we're going to open things up to questions from our, our live audience, and, and we're going to start, and we'll just go Youngblood for a couple, then Baldwin Wallace with a couple if you guys have. I know we got some varying ages there, uh, but feel free to shoot away with those questions. And then I have a question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Lofton. Now, is Youngblood, are you guys in Houston? Yes. yes. Now it, it's funny. I was just talking about. I was talking about connections, right? Now, Houston is where my family is from originally. My father, years and years ago, went to Jackie Yates High School. Have you guys heard of Yates High School? Yes. 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 Another one person apart. And Baldwin Wallace, the college. I spent a week there when I was in uh, college in between football games. We, played football games. we were going to play Michigan later. And so we stayed at Baldwin Wallace so University. And one of the great track and field athletes of all time, Harrison Dillard, was a uh, student at Baldwin Wallace. He won gold medals, I believe, in the 1948 Olympics and then in the 1952 Olympics. So look at the connections. And Jerry, he's stuck up there in Canton. We don't know anything about Canton, do we? <laughs> he said stuck like it's a bad thing <laughs> no you're, you're a star i said a star in can oh a star in can okay i miss i misheard that thank you <laughs> i appreciate that um uh, we're gonna go with the first question uh young blood if you guys got a question I i'll just remind you young blood we've got we're getting a little bit of an echo uh your your microphone's probably next to your speaker so we're getting a little echo so it, right after you ask the question you make sure to mute your microphone uh, so we're not getting that echo as we're talking. But go ahead with the first question, uh, Youngblood. Hello. Hello. My first question is, as an adult now, what was your thoughts becoming a professional football player? That, that really is a good question. I grew up in, in Los Angeles. Um, and I, I had no idea what it took to become a professional football player. When I was, when I was 10, I was really interested in becoming 11. <laughs> when I was 11, I was really interested in becoming 12. Uh, I, I played sports. I wasn't always the best kid on the team, but I really enjoyed it. Um, my, my dad, I ended up growing up with just my dad. My parents had gotten divorced, and I was the youngest of four kids. And um, for me, School was always important. I did well in school, and, and I enjoyed sports. I played football, basketball, baseball, and I, I ran track at the, at the local park. But I was never that can't-miss kid, you know, the kid that everybody looked at and said, oh, he's, he's going to be really good. It just happened where I had a chance to go to college, and I developed later on. But when I, when I was young, you know, I just wanted to be a year older, I guess. Great question to start the program off. Uh, uh, young boy, if you have another one, go ahead. We'll, we'll take that, and then we'll go to Baldwin Wallace, and then I'll interject one from our webinar audience. Um, well, my name is Felix. Uh, what position did you play in football? <laughs> no, that's a, that's a good question, Felix. Yeah, I heard somebody behind them say wide receiver. 
and and when I the first time I ever played football, I was 12 years old, and I played defensive tackle. And the next year, I was 13. I played defensive end. And when I got to high school in the ninth grade, I played quarterback. So I played quarterback for uh, four years in high school. And then when I got to college, I, I moved to receiver. But before I moved to receiver, I did play defensive back for probably about a month in college, and then they moved me to wide receiver. So good question, Felix. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Young. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Was that the, uh, um, Harriet Foster? little bow there at the end. <laughs> Go ahead, Ball Walsh. Make sure to speak up. Come on. Oh, that's that's really quiet. We're gonna have to have you step up to the microphone. Okay, we have one more. One more. Okay. Hello, my name is Jason. Young bud, uh, just a second, young bud. Just a second. Go ahead, Ball Walsh. On, on behalf of the University of Baltimore, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to spend time with us. I really appreciate it. And actually, I, just a side note, I actually used to live in Houston a few years ago in uh, Galveston. So, great city. And my question is, what made you want to go into media after you retired from playing football? Ooh, that, that's, that's, that is a pretty good one. Um, when I first started playing in 1978, um, you didn't have, it's crazy. There was no cable television. ESPN hadn't started. There was no HBO. There was no internet. So a lot of the media things that we see now, uh, as I was driving over here this morning, uh, I was listening to sports talk radio and there was a guy in there who covers all 32 teams. It's called cover 32 and he covers them on Twitter. And I'm going, Really? So uh, you asked me about when I got interested in it. I, I had a television show when I was in Green Bay, and I don't know if I was thinking that was what I wanted to do when I was finished um, because I, did, I didn't know when my career was going to be over. Uh, during the middle part of my career, I got my securities license with Merrill Lynch, so I thought I was going to go into being a stockbroker. Well, I didn't retire. I played about five more years. And when I finished, I was going, well, you know, what do I do now? And uh, I started, I pursued the broadcasting. Uh, and after I'd been in broadcasting, when I first retired for about seven or eight years, I thought, I want to coach. I really think that I could coach because I had been asked to coach when I first retired, but I wasn't ready to start doing it. So I had a chance to coach. I coached for seven years and uh, I got back into broadcasting. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy being around the game. I enjoy the different aspects of, of media. And, and it has it has changed so much, so much. Uh, you know, from little things like satellite radio to uh, the different cable shows that are on to the webinars that we're doing right now. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a growing field. And it, I think it's, it's in a way it's a little bit limitless. It's a good question. Great question. Thank you very much, Paul Mollison. If you have another one, go ahead and uh, step up to that microphone there. I know you guys have uh, some questions Is there. Is it go just ahead. the two of you in the room in Baldwin Wallace? Pardon? Is it just the two of you in the room? No, there's a couple <laughs> others over here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you said that, or we noted at the beginning that you were involved in multiple charities. Uh, like, this is kind of personal, but which one do you think has left the biggest impact on you personally? Well, the, the one that has left the biggest impact on me is one that I don't do that my wife does. And my wife, through our church, drives cancer patients to their treatments. Uh, she drives them to um, you know, pick up groceries, to run errands. And a lot of these people are in the, I hate to say it, but the last year of their life. Um, and so seeing her do this, uh, she's kind of like my hero because it, it's something that I couldn't do. I am, I'm pretty good at doing a big event, but doing something one-on-one -on -one with somebody is a little tougher for me and uh, watching her do it and the relationships that she uh, forms with these people when they really don't have anybody else. They might not have family members close or anything. 
she kind of steps in to bridge that gap. So uh, it's funny, we have been uh, hit uh, with this Ebola scare uh, that's been going on. And it, 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 yes, it's a deadly disease, but there are people out there who are working with these patients. Uh, just recently, a, a doctor who was working over in Africa was transferred over here and died. But there he is, dedicating his life to try and save people, to, to do something for them. So anytime you can do something one-on-one -on -one with somebody, uh, that, that's, that's what is really rewarding. Uh, and when I got to coach, it, it was kind of like, you know, that was my way of, of giving back of kind of infusing into the life of these young football players in the National Football League some of the lessons that I had learned. And uh, so that was a lot of fun for me. And, and I, I took it very seriously because I thought that you, you got to help them because there are a lot of things out there that are distractions for them that can trip them up that they don't know about that you as a, somebody who's been down that same road, you can, you can help them out. Thank you. Thank you, BW students. I uh, appreciate the great question. We're going to go, I'm going to go to our social media, and we've got a question from the Legacy Leadership Project student athletes. And I think it's great, you know, that we're going from uh, um, college students to soon to be college students, high school athletes. Uh, what do you believe is the biggest temptation for a college student athlete today? And how do you imagine you would have dealt with that if you were playing now? I think the, not, not the biggest temptation, but uh, last week I was, got a chance to talk to a college football team. And uh, I was down at the University of Florida, and on, on Monday, during the, after the practice was over, the, the coach let me address the team. And so, you know, I realized these guys have been out at practice for, you know, two and a half hours. They're hungry. They're ready to go to dinner. What can I say to them in two or three minutes that, they'll be able to latch on to. So I said to him, I said, when you guys get finished here, finished playing, when you're four or five years up, you should have your hand out. You should have your hand out asking, where is it? And, and they, they kind of looked at me kind of funny. They're going, well, what, what is he talking about? I said, well, at the end of four or five years, while you've been a college football player, what are you going to walk away with? What is this college going to give you in return for playing football for them. And the only thing that they can give you, college football players are not paid. Yes, they do get a scholarship to go to school, but their real payment is that they get a degree when they're finished because they're gonna be an ex player a lot longer than they were a player. So when you're in college and you have that great chance to go to school, finish, it's, it's a lot like, you know, if you, if you got a summer job and, you know, after two months during the summer, your boss hadn't paid you, you'd be kind of going, well, when am I going to get paid? It's the same way when you go to college, whether you're on a football scholarship or whether your parents have paid for you to go to school, whether you've taken out loans, the only payment that that university can give you is your degree. Yes, you can learn a lot, you can have great experiences, but if you leave school without getting your degree, you've really worked without getting paid. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lofton, and thank you to the Legacy Leadership Student Project, uh, student athletes there in, uh, there in the, the Orange County area, California. So uh, let's go back to Houston, Texas, uh, Youngblood Intermediate. If you want to go ahead and unmute there, and uh, next question, go ahead. I know you guys already, already have student ready. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, did your teachers in school encourage you to what you are um, today on the Hall of Fame? Now, I, I see your, what's your name? Jason Jacobs. Your, your first name Jason is? Jacobs. Jason? Jason, the, Jason. You, are, you guys are the young blood. I can see your mascot. Are you guys the Lions or? The Wildcats. Oh, the Wildcats. <laughs> um, what, what it is, every day I am reminded of, of one of my teachers that I had when I was in high school. Mr. Blackburn was my math and science teacher, and I was in this kind of like this little special program where uh, about 30 students through high school, we all had the same classes together. But Mr. Blackburn was my 
uh, algebra teacher, my geometry teacher, my trigonometry teacher on the math side, and then chemistry and biology on the science side. But he was also the, the we had this club called the Ecology Club. And the Ecology Club was, we were kind of looking out for the earth and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he was kind of a guy. So I think of Mr. Blackburn every time I'm leaving a room and I turn off the lights. Because his thing was, we've got to protect the earth. So Mr. Blackburn had a huge impact on me when it was time for me to go to college. Because I'd gone through high school and, and all of a sudden I'm getting recruited during my senior year. Colleges are starting to come around and saying, okay, we'd like you to come look at our university and you know, what, would, what do you want to major in? I hadn't thought about going to college. Uh, the only person in my family who had gone to college at that time was, was my dad, but he hadn't graduated from college. He went to Prairie View down in Texas. And so all of a sudden I was asked, being asked to, what do you want to major in? And Mr. Blackburn, I said, Mr. Blackburn, what should I major in? He said, well, he said, you're good in math, you're good in science. Why don't you think about engineering? So all of a sudden I said, okay, I want to major in engineering. And Mr. Blackburn was the reason for me doing that. Now, you asked about his impact on me being a football player and where does that work? You know, he's telling me to be an engineer and this and that because there's a, a system of thinking when you're an engineer. You're, you're used to solving problems and doing things like that. And I thought as a wide receiver on the football field, I was really good at solving problems, looking at angles and, and dissecting a defense. So Mr. Blackburn, my math and science teacher, I think had as much an impact as a lot of my coaches did when I was getting ready to uh, play football and obviously ended up being in the Hall of Fame. And I still think about Mr. Blackburn and some of the things that he taught us every day. Good question. Great question there. So uh, if you guys want to go to another question from uh, Youngblood, if you guys got another one, go ahead. I think they're getting the next student lined up here. Maybe. There we go. If you guys can unmute there. You guys are still muted. All right. Well, let's go. Let's go back. Let's see if they can get the unmuted work worked out there. Uh, let's go back to our friends at uh, Baldwin Wallace. If you want to go ahead with the next question, go ahead. What was your What was the toughest adjustment you had to make after you retired from the NFL? You know, there is a. Um, it's coming up, and I think it's on HBO, and they're coming up with this. And and obviously, once it's on TV, it, it's even more dramatic. But it does portray. Um, issues that guys have when they retire. Now, the last year that I played, that the last calendar year from uh, January through the end of December, I wore the uniform of four different teams. In January of the last year, I played in the Super Bowl with the Buffalo Bills. I went to training camp with the Los Angeles Raiders. I got cut at the end of training camp with the Raiders. I got picked up in week two or three with the Los Angeles Rams. And both these teams were my hometown teams at the time. I played for a month with the Rams. I got released by the Rams. I got picked up the next week, and I played the last 10 games of the year with the Philadelphia Eagles. So in the last year that I played, I played on four different teams. And it didn't take somebody smarter than me to realize, hey, your career is kind of over at this point been on four different teams you've been you know really released three times and it's kind of the end so I didn't have this feeling after 16 years oh I could still play I think one of the toughest things is that guys are so young when they stop playing you know if a guy plays five or six years which is a long time to play in the National Football League he's only 27 or 28 years old and it's it's the what do I do next because now there's that gap because when you finish playing, when you're five or six years in, you keep thinking, I could play another year. So you, you train and you work out, and you, you don't get a chance to go to training camp, or you go to training camp, you get cut. You say, well, if I just stay in shape, maybe somebody will call. And that may last for another two years. So now you have this gap between you and everybody else that you went to college with. And you also have this feeling that 
what do I really enjoy doing? And the thing that you always enjoy doing was playing football. And it's kind of like, what do I do next? And I think that's what, it's, it's that, that lost feeling, you know, and, and maybe some of you guys who are in college are going, college is great. I, I don't mind going to class, even the eight o'clock classes early in the morning, because you go to eight o'clock class, you go to nine o'clock class, you're really done with class by noon, you got the rest of the day. But what do you do next? What, what kind of job do you want? It used to be years and years ago where somebody took a job and they worked there for 30 years and then they got a gold watch. Now people change jobs a lot. So I think change is something that is tough for a football player and it's probably tough for you guys, but it's something that you have to learn to adapt to. And uh, you know, we talked about those six pillars earlier. And if you embrace those pillars, you know, when you work somewhere, People are going to look at those qualities in you and say, this is somebody that we like. And, and even if you do have to change jobs and you need a recommendation from that person, you, you're going to get a glowing recommendation. So I think the, the change aspect and the unknown aspect are always tough no matter, no matter what you're doing, even if you've been a professional football player. And it may be even tougher if you've been a professional football player if you've had people cheering for you. So I, th I think stepping away from that spotlight is always tough. Good question. Great question there. Let's go back. Let's see if uh, Young Blood, if not, uh, Bowmalls, be ready for the next one. Young Blood, let's see if we can get the microphone unmuted. I'm still not getting anything from you. Uh, there we go. There you go. Oh, Jennifer, speak. Um, well, what are your other goals in life besides being a professional football player? What are my other goals in life? Well. I was a professional football player. I stopped being a professional football player 20 years ago. So I played for 16 years, which played for six time. But so for the last um, 20 years, I have worked in broadcasting. I've worked as a coach. And, you know, as you get older, you know, guys, you guys are probably doing the math for him. Boy, he is old. He, he didn't look real old, but he is old. Last year, my oldest son and his wife, we had our first grandchild. So we have a little grandson named Jackson, and Jackson is dropped off at our house at eight in the morning because both his mom and his dad went back to work. And so my wife and I get to watch Jackson. He runs around the house. He's a little bit over a year and a half now. And he chases our little dog, Baxter, who weighs five pounds around the house. So when you get older, your, your goals kind of change a little bit. My goal is to continue working in broadcasting, but also to be uh, – a grandparent and have fun being a grandparent. Okay, good question. Great question there, uh, young blood. We're gonna go back to another one here in just a second from you guys, but before we do that, Mr. Lofton, if I can just interject here real quick. Um, you know, we talked about it earlier with uh, with some of your, um, your 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 college football or your high school football coach. Who who were really your mentors growing up? Who, because I think it's important, you know, as as athletes, uh, you know, we have no problem if we're having problems, with, you know, with a foul, sh foul shooting or, or you know, uh, need better foot speed or need to get strength. We have no problem going to coaches asking, what does it take to, to get better in these areas? But for some reason, when it comes to education, we all of a sudden don't want to ask for help uh, when we might need it. So who are some of your mentors and, and what's your philosophy on, on, on uh, uh, seeking help from people for, for you know, any area of your life? It was funny. I mentioned uh, Mr. Blackburn and, and how impactful he was in terms of he was such a good teacher. Uh, and, I, and I look back on it now and I might not have realized it then, but he had this this relationship that was part teacher, uh, part friend and part mentor. And, and I think one of the things that we forget about our teachers, we see our teachers um, you know, at the beginning of the day in the morning. And, and then, you know, when we leave school at the end of the day, we think, well, the teaching job has ended. One thing I realized when I got to coach, I was constantly thinking about my players that I coached. And believe it or not, your teachers are constantly thinking about you and what they can do to help you learn better, to help you process the information better, to, to help you grow. And you, you may not believe that. You may look at them and go, oh, they don't care about us. They spend so much time away from the classroom preparing for you, doing little things that are going to make a huge difference for you later on. And so when, when I look at my life and I look back in the rearview mirror and I say, 
this teacher, that teacher, I mentioned Mr. Blackburn, Miss De La Rosa, who was our uh, English teacher, who we had for three years, and the books that we read and the things that I learned. So those teachers, along with all the coaches that I had, were so impactful. And, uh, you know, as you're kind of just floating through it, you're going through school and, you know, you're showing up at 8 in the morning, you're leaving at 3. They do so much work, and you, you have to be so thankful for what they are able to do and what they're able to infuse in you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawson. Let's go back to Youngblood. If you have another question, go ahead and have that student step up there and unmute, unmute the microphone. Hello, my name is Xavier. My question was, how old was you when you got drafted into national football? That's a, that's a good question. I was um, just a couple weeks short of my 22nd birthday, so I was 21 years old. Um, and, you know, when, when you, it, it's not, when, when I got drafted, it wasn't like guys who get drafted now. It wasn't a televised event. Um, I knew what time the draft started and, um, I had a, a phone in my apartment that I was living in at the time and the draft started, I want to say around eight o'clock California time. So at about five minutes to eight, I got a call from um, the Los Angeles Rams. Boy, was I excited because Los Angeles was my hometown. So about 30 minutes later, and, and I still remember her voice, and, and I got to know her afterwards, but I got a call, and it said, James Lofton, this is Carol Edwin from the Green Bay Packers. Can you hold for Coach Bart Starr? And that's how I found out that I was getting drafted by the Green Bay Packers. And uh, Bart Starr was my coach. He also played for the Green Bay Packers, and Carol was the, uh, the secretary for the Green Bay Packers. And um, so those two people introduced me to the Green Bay Packers, and that was when I got drafted. Good question. Great question. Thank you very much. We'll go back to uh, Baldwin Wallace, and then I'll interject one from our, uh, our webinar audience as well. So go ahead, Baldwin Wallace. If uh, concussions and uh, player safety were an issue back when you started, would you still pursue a NFL career? Oof. Um, you know, it was interesting. My sons are now 30 and 27, and they both played all the way through high school, and they both played collegiately uh, in college. And when I would go watch them play, first thing is, I, you know, I wanted them to have success while they were playing. But I was also always concerned about, you know, the big hits. Uh, my younger son played and really talented. He got hurt every year that he played, where he had an injury that cost him to miss games. Uh, my older son didn't have as many injuries, uh, did have uh, his shoulder operated on and different things like that. But, yeah, the, the concussion thing would, would concern me a little bit. Uh, you know, looking at my grandson now and, you know, the way that he bounces around, and I'm thinking – well, I just hope he's real fast or that he can jump real high, that he could, you know, do something that, that, that where you're not getting pounded all the time. But it's, it's, it's a great sport. Um, I was talking to a, a player uh, last week. I was in Indianapolis for the uh, Sunday night game, and there's a kid who returns punts, and he happened to go to Stanford. I worked with him a little bit this uh, past summer because I work with uh, wide receivers when they're getting ready to go to camp or they're getting ready for the combine and different things like that. So I worked with him, but he had been getting just blasted on punt returns all year long. And he's a really smart kid. I'm thinking, you know, he's not going to be real smart after getting hit all like this a lot. So I just told him, I said, you need to stop taking all these hits. And he kind of shook his head. He said, you're right. Um, but it, it is a very physical game. And uh, I, I think the, the concussion protocol that they put in now to check players while the game is going on is really important. And uh, Sure, I wish it would have been in place when I was playing, and it, it might have saved some of the players who uh, have had some problems once they've retired. Good question. Great question, Bob Wallace. We'll come back to you for another one here in just a minute, but let me interject one from, uh, looks like it's from Anonymous, but uh, uh, the question is, uh, what do you consider is your uh, single greatest achievement in life, and why? Oh, um it's probably not sports related. 
Um, although I, I, I am really passionate about sports. Uh, I've, I've always, you know, it's funny. Somebody asked me what I wanted to be. I always wanted to be an athlete. Um, I didn't know that, you know, you could be a professional athlete, but I still enjoy working out now and staying in shape and doing all that. Single greatest uh, accomplishment. Once you become a parent and your kids are doing okay, that really is your greatest accomplishment. You know, when, uh, when my son told me that he and his wife were pregnant and then they found out they were going to have a boy. And so then he goes, well, we're going to name him Jackson. I said, oh, that's a great name. He said, it's, we'll spell it J-A-X-O-N, which is a little different. He said, yeah, he's going to be Jackson James. And when he said Jackson James Lofton, it just, my, my allergies started kicking up a little bit, got a little teary-eyed, because it was, it's something that you look at and you go, the most important thing in life is, to me, is really being a parent and being a good parent. And uh, so that's what's important. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh those that t t sent that in over the webinar, whoever anonymous might be, uh, continue to feel free to send in uh, any others that you guys have out there that are tuned over the w webinar. Uh, let's go back to uh, Baldwin Wallace again. Uh, if you have another question, go ahead. We'll go to Houston Inter or Youngblood Intermediate right after that. <coughs> All right, Mr. Lofton, given the kind of character-based uh, element of the discussion today, can you give an example of either from your playing career or from your professional career, where you maybe had to take a stand to uphold one of those uh, core pillars? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to give you one from, uh, from my head coach, Bart Starr. Bart Starr played for the Green Bay Packers in the late, in the early 60s, and they were a championship team. They won the first two Super Bowls. Um, they had won NFL championships before that. And as good as the Packers are now with Aaron Rodgers, they were even better with Bart Starr, believe it or not. They actually got the name of, called Title Town and because they won so many championships. Well, Bart Starr was our head coach. And, you know, kind of when you're, when you're young, 22 years old, 23 years old, you can be a little cynical to the authority figures. But Bart Starr came into the meeting room during training camp one year, and he said, he said men, you guys have got to do better. So we're thinking, you know, he's about to, you know, scold us about how practice had gone or, you know, the last preseason game or something like that. He said, the locker room and the training room are a mess. He said, when you cut your tape off, you're supposed to throw it in the trash can. It's on the floor. When you take your T-shirts off and your socks off, you're supposed to put them in the laundry bin. And in the, in the, um, in the lunchroom, where you're being served, the least you can do is take your tray back and put it over there so the ladies can clean it off and do that, but you're leaving it at the tables. He said, the true measure of a man, and when he said this, when he said the next phrase, I, I still feel it whenever I see people treat people a certain way. He said, the true measure of a man is by how he treats somebody who can do nothing for him. So, sure, there was going to be somebody who was going to come to the locker room and, and pick up the tape and throw the soiled T-shirts and the socks in the right laundry bin. And there was going to be somebody who was going to come behind you and clean up your mess that you had left in the lunchroom. But the true measure of a man is how you treat somebody who can do nothing for you. And if you're going to do that, you're going to put your tape in the trash can. You're going to put your dirty T-shirt in the laundry bin. You're going to take your tray and, and scrape it off and, and give it to the person who's going to clean it. And so when you look at life like that, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, care, and citizenship, all those come into play because that's how you treat somebody. And that's how you want to be treated. So I, I think that was one of, you know, just a striking moment for me when he said that. Good question. And hopefully if anybody's taking notes, which is what I am doing as well, is that you might have written that quote down because that's uh, definitely some words to, uh, to live by in, in your life. So uh, let's go to one last question from Youngblood. I see it's about 1 o'clock Eastern time, so it's about uh, finish time. So let's go about to – About lunchtime. Yeah, it's about lunchtime. That's right. So let's go to one more question from Youngblood and then ask uh, Mr. Lofton with his uh, closing remarks. Closing remarks. 
Uh, hi, my name is Ritaj. Um, some, some, sometimes uh, NFL players like you, James, Mr. James Lawton, switch to another team. But how do you feel when you switch? The slight possibility you may be playing against your old team. You know what the craziest thing is about when you switch from one team to another team? Say you've been on that team for four or five years. So you have all the T-shirts of the Houston Texans and your family and friends. They've got your jersey and a couple of T-shirts and hats and all that. And then you switch to and you're going to play for the Atlanta Falcons. What do you do with all that stuff? You know, and that happened to me. And that was the, the biggest challenge. Sure, you can, you can switch teams and, and you're going to play against your friends every once in a while. But what do you do with all the stuff? Do you, do you keep it? You know, and so that, that's the craziest thing that's funny about that. Because the next team that you're on, that's the team that's important. You know, just like you guys at Youngblood Middle School. Are you guys are in middle school, aren't you? No? Elementary school or middle school? Which is, which is kind of like middle school. So when you guys go to high school, you're going to be a member of that high school. And it's like we had talked about citizenship, it's being a member of that community, just like being a member of the team. And I see the guy doing push-ups. That's three, four, five. Pretty impressive back there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lofton. Mr. Lofton, I know we, we've, we've touched on a lot of things and, and uh, something from, you know, a quote that your mom said to do something nice for, or your wife said for do something nice for someone else to, I, I love this, the true test of a person is, is how, he, um, how you treat a person that can do nothing for you. Um, you know, I just think those are the words to live by. Are, are there, are there any, is there anything you would like to either reiterate that you've talked on today or anything else that you'd like to touch on before we close out the program? Uh, sure. Um, one thing, it's funny, people will ask me, you know, how often do you wear the gold jacket? And really, I, I don't wear it very often. Um, you know, I broke it out for this occasion. But I, I think when I was in college, and I was on the track team, and there was, there was something, I had a track coach by the name of Peyton Jordan. And Peyton Jordan had been the head coach of the Olympic team. He had been a track and field athlete himself at uh, the University of Southern California. He had been a world record holder. But he was the most humble man I had ever met. And in our track and field locker room, which was a little dingy locker room, on the, uh, right above the door as you exited the locker room, it sh it, there was a quote that said, champions should be gracious and humble. And, you know, when I go to games now and I do games and there's music before the games and, there, you know, a guy makes a big play and he's dancing, he makes a sack or he catches a pass and he's posturing and all that kind of stuff. We see that. And but all that is part of entertainment. And so the guys are there to really entertain you. When I get to interview guys in Hall of Famers and I interview uh, players who are playing now, guys really are a lot more humble than what they appear on, on, on the field sometimes when the adrenaline is going and when they want to show the fans that they want them to get involved and they want to get them hyped up. So through your life, whatever you accomplish, it's great. You don't have to pat yourself on the back because other people will notice what you're doing. So be humble, appreciate what other people are doing, acknowledge other people, tell them they're doing a good job, and in turn, you know, you'll feel good about what you're doing. So I think one thing, champions should be gracious and humble. And you can be a champion on the field, in the classroom, and in your everyday life.